Abigail Dalton. I'm the assistant director of the behavioral health group here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know me, Shabela Flaherty, who I'm sure many of you know is off in the corner of filming. Um, so if you have friends who really wanted to watch this tonight and couldn't make it, we will be making it available online. Uh, so this is the, I believe, third or fourth year that we've done this panel. Um, and we like to think of it as a good opportunity for students to see what's out there in the world of behavioral insights and behavioral science, not just for those of you who might want to go work for really perfect organizations like the Behavioral Insights Team or ideas 42 but also people thinking about other sectors. We realize that a lot of you are going to be going off into many different career paths, and we want to make sure you understand that we're here to train you Again, not just to specialize, but to be able to take what this work is into a variety of different sectors and teach them why behavioral science is valuable. Uh, and I think now more than ever, uh, it would be great to impart the value of science and data and research into policy moving forward. Uh, so I'll go through and introduce our speakers, and then we'll have a few questions for each of them so they can talk about where they're coming from, what their organizations do, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So I will go from this way. So Julia Featherston is a project leader with the Boston Consulting Group. She applies her training as a behavioral economist to help create more open, transparent, and innovative societies. She holds a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School, where her thesis focused on evaluating the impacts of emerging behavioral insights team around, teams around the world. And she has an undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Sydney. Uh, Danielle Kudasov is an associate advisor with the Behavioral Insights Team's North America office, and she previously worked as a strategy and change internal consultant with IBM, and she received her BA in economics from Princeton. Uh, Sarah Welch is an idea, uh, vice president at Ideas42, where she is currently working on behavioral innovations in sustainability, consumer finance, and health. Prior to joining Ideas42, Sarah completed a three-year dual degree program at Yale School of Management and School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where she focused on urban resource management and planning. Uh, and she has her BA from Harvard. And Bailey O'Donnell joined Google in 2007 and is now working to open source Google's people practices. She supports the people analytics mission to ensure all people decisions are driven by data and manage uh, previously a suite of programs to shed light on cognitive biases and the effects that they have on employees' workplace experiences. Uh, she's worked in the Google offices in Mountain View, Buenos Aires, London, New York, and DC, and has a BA in international relationship, uh, international relations from Brown. And you do not have to be pregnant to work in behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Just to know. <laughs> uh, so I think we'll start with it sure helps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Julia, let's get started with you. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, and again. Uh, you can feel free at the end of going down the line to chime in with your own. So Julia, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about what BCG does and how you utilize behavioral insights, uh, a little bit about your own personal career path and how you got to BCG and what you're doing now, what experience graduates can expect at your organization, uh, and any advice for students interested in utilizing a career in behavioral insights. Sure. Well, first, um, thanks very much for having me, um, Abby and Chaville, and thanks everyone for coming today. It's always nice to be able to talk about your work with people who are interested in it and passionate about the same things. Um, so um, as Abby said, I'm a project leader and I specialize mostly in our work around behavioral economics at the Boston Consulting Group. The Boston Consulting Group, um, as many, maybe most of you um, will know, is a global strategy consulting firm. Um, are there like, people who know this very well? Are there people who are hearing the words Boston Consulting Group for the first time? Okay, um, and so we are headquartered, as um, the name might suggest, here in Boston, um, but have offices, have 88 offices um, in about 75 countries around the world. Um, and so um, we do a whole range of things, as you might um, expect, helping companies think about their most complicated challenges um, from a range of perspectives, whether that's about um, you know, from cash management to think about how you optimize your operations to understanding how you interact with customers or citizens. Lots of our work is in the private sector, um, but by no means all of it. So um, increasingly a really big chunk of BCG's work, bigger or smaller, depending on the geography, is in the public sector. There are some geographies like Australia, which is where I'm from, where that chunk of the business is really large. Um, and then also social impact where I spend a lot of my time. Um, and that stream um, of our work 
operates the same um, as all of the other work we do. Um, we, we staff it exactly the same. We obviously, not surprisingly, bill it a little bit differently, but you know, for my purposes, for everyone else's intents and purposes, um, it works the same. Of all of that that we do, what do we actually do um, in behavioral insights um, and behavioral economics? I think about it in a couple of ways. Um, so the first is helping everyone um, inside our organization see it as a really fundamental part of almost everything we do. So, like, what are we actually doing as advisors to companies or to governments or to NGOs? You're actually helping people to make change, usually in situations where change is difficult. You probably wouldn't be there if it was easy and straightforward. People would um, do it themselves. Um, so with that in mind, it's worth everyone in our organization Having a, I think, I mean, I think it would be great if everyone had a deep understanding of behavioral science, human behaviors, um, and the various biases that can limit us and our clients when we make decisions. Um, that's not always possible, but helping them think about what the basics are that they need is something I spend a reasonable amount of my time doing. What does that look like? It looks like workshops for our global offices. I've actually just been in Dubai last week doing this. It looks like training sessions for particular groups or practice areas. So if people say, well, you know, I mostly do operations. Why is this relevant for me? Like, I help people use machines better. Helping them think about what it might mean for them. That's the first part, thinking about um, how it makes a difference. The second is that um, we have a number of specific projects that actually focus on how you might leverage behavior to help people make change. Um, so, for example, I'm working on one at the moment that helps think about how do you nudge um, companies to uh, offer their um, employees benefits, including paid family and medical leave, which might be of more or less interest to different people in the room, um, <laughs> depending on where you're at in your life right now. Um, and think about not only what are, and what changes they might want to make to make their teams more effective. So can you test the impact of different interventions? Like, for example, having fewer meetings, having smaller <coughs> meetings. What difference do those make to people's level of engagement, level of overall satisfaction, but also um, to their productivity? Occasionally, we work on really specific um, intervention designs that are um, explicitly behavioral. Um, so. In general, BCG's client engagements and the names of clients and what you do for them are confidential for good reason. But one that I can talk about that's going on right now is some work that I'm doing with a former assistant district attorney here in Massachusetts. His name is Adam Foss. Um, and a ex-BCG, um, but now Grammy-winning um, artist, John Legend, to help think about um, both of those equally important parts of their career, obviously, um, both like very valuable, um, to help think about the role of prosecutors, that is your assistant district attorneys, the people who show up in court, um, on outcomes in the criminal justice system. And the question that we're working on is whether prosecutors, who are this like pretty unglamorous, pretty under-discussed actor within the United States criminal justice system, can actually be trained and motivated and incentivized um, to make decisions differently. In particular, can you empower prosecutors to do the things they're already allowed to do, like refer people to rehabilitation or continuing education, or that kind of thing. So then we're working um, with um, them and the new organization that they're setting up to begin um, to say, well, what would that look like? like? What are the interventions you need to do? What are the pilots that you need to run? to make that happen. So occasionally, we have those kinds of quite specific um, projects. You see them more often in the social sector and in the public sector, but not exclusively. So I also spend time with our commercial clients doing something similar in a very different context, saying like, what is the behavior that you're trying to motivate? Um, and what are the interventions that might work? And then also um, helping them think through how you get really comfortable with the idea um, of experimentation inside your organization, which for some people is something really exciting and for other folks um, is something new, like they just want to pick something and do that, um, and they're not necessarily super comfortable with the idea um, that you 
where they would, um, if you would experiment um, on your employees. I'm super excited to hear if other people have this conversation all the time and how it, um, and how it plays out. Um, and then the third piece um, that I spend a lot of time doing is basically capability building for clients, helping clients develop that same kind of understanding um, and that same toolkit of behavioral science and behavioral economics that might be useful in their organization, um, whatever context um, they end up being in. It means that over time, they hopefully don't need someone like me, but over time, that's something that their organization can do themselves, and having a richer understanding of the context can probably, over time, do it in ways that are unexpected um, and surprising, but probably really positive. Um, I came to doing this like many of you. I was um, here at the Kennedy School. I had been at BCG before and had focused really heavily on the public sector. I um, <coughs> came to the Kennedy School mostly because I was really passionate about decision making, about understanding how behavioral economics and behavioral insights might be applied in particular to the public sector and the social sector, but also to the like, world of work and the universe um, decision, of decisions that people make there. I think in general, um, at BCG, we're doing more and more of this kind of work. I think more and more people are recognizing how important it is to everything they do. I think more and more people are asking us about it as well, which I think is terrific. Um, it's still a relatively small part um, of what we do, but for the folks who do do it, we spend a lot of time on it. Lots of you um, who are second years will probably know Phil Ames and James Wilson, um, who both after succumbance to the behavioral economics team of Australia, Australia's uh, federal behavioral insights team, and now back at BCG and thinking about how they can apply um, what they've learned. So I think at all the different stages, there's lots of opportunity to do it. How do you have to do on the questions? That was great. <laughs> um, any advice for the students who are currently here? Um, I'm really passionate about this. I mean, of course, one, one would hope. Um, but I mean that. Like, I have this really fundamental belief that um, we and you now have this really powerful toolkit of knowledge that still not very many people have that you actually can harness to make the lives of the people that you directly work with, the people you touch better. Like I think about it all the time in terms of like the actual teams that I'm on. How can those teams be made better and more effective? How do we test them? Um, and I'm happy to talk about the like different experiments I have running on BCGs at the moment um, <laughs> afterwards. Um, how can we make their lives better? But how actually do you like go out into the world and do a service for folks with the knowledge that you have? Recognizing that it's something that you can share that um, can change the way in which organizations operate, how they interact with citizens and customers. Um, and so I would say, like, really hold on um, to this knowledge that you have gained. What, like, whatever you do post graduation, I think there will be an opportunity um, to apply it. And being really mindful about those opportunities and saying, um, this is something I know about. Um, this might not look immediately like a behavioral problem. or well, this might not necessarily look like a situation where behavioral insights um, might be a benefit to us, but like, let me widen the lens a little bit um, for you, for whoever um, the folks you're interacting with are, um, and be able to offer that to them. But I, I, I think there is almost ne like there is almost never a place where it is not of service to people. Danielle, great. Well, um, Ditto, thank you so much for having me. I've uh, been in New York for the past few years, so it's nice to get out to Boston mm -hmm. and explore Cambridge. Um, you all live in a lovely area, as you know. Um, so I'm from the Behavioral Insights team, and we uh, were founded as part of the British government in 2010. But we've since spun out, and we're now a social purpose company. Um, with still our headquarters office in London, and that's where most of our people are, but we also have an office in Brooklyn, which is where I'm based, in Singapore, in Australia, so um, really all over now. And our mission has pretty much remained the same since we were founded, which is to bring to government and just for social purpose organizations um, an understanding and an application of how humans really behave and think into their work. Um, so rather than assuming that um, consumers or residents of cities or citizens of countries are perfectly rational and 
read everything that comes to them and make you know perfectly rational decisions like we'd see in an econ textbook. We take people where they are, we analyze government services and messages and campaigns, and think about what are the points where they're not necessarily taking into account those, those quirks or those biases and help them to overcome those. Um, and so that's a big piece of our work. And another piece is this experimentation or data piece, which again, there's kind of varying levels of receptiveness that we see with different governments and civil servants that we work with, but we really strongly encourage um, and push for rigorously testing every tweak or test that we're, um, that we're proposing to make sure that a behavioral insight that has worked in the literature and other places actually works as we think it's going to um, in the specific context. So just to give kind of a few more concrete examples of the type of, of work we do, um, one of the kind of classic examples in behavioral science literature is the, sh the social norms, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and so in our UK office, we've done a lot of work on inserting different variations of social norms messaging and seeing what effect does that have on delinquent taxpayers. Um, so there we saw huge amounts of you know, increased revenue from delinquent taxpayers. And interestingly, the more specific the norm is there, the more likely that person is to repay the money. So if you, you know, say nine out of 10 people in your local area pay their tax on time, that brings forward more revenue. If you say nine out of 10 people with your debt level and in your local area, even more revenue. So that's kind of one example of the type of work that we did in the UK. Um, another big area for us is police, uh, police recruiting, which is, um, both in the UK and here in the US, an area that's kind of a hot topic in the news. Police forces are looking to better represent the communities that they serve. Um, so we've done work in the UK and in the US on the recruitment process, the application process, and looking at points where maybe there's stereotype threat that's being activated, things like that. Um, so an example of that that we did in the UK was at a specific point in the application process to become a police officer, um, there's a situational judgment test. So we weren't able to change the actual test, but we were seeing a huge um, kind of disparity based on ethnic background of candidates on who was passing this test. And that wasn't attributable to education or class, it was due to their ethnic backgrounds. And so rather than changing the test itself, we looked at actually the, the email um, inviting people to take the test. And we found that it was really cold, very kind of legal sounding. It was like, it appears you've uh, qualified for this stage, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Rather than changing the test, we just kind of tweaked that email and tested against the original, a friendlier email and an email that included a line that we added, which said, um, take a few moments to think about what it would mean to you and your community if you were a police officer. So the idea there being that stereotype threat was being activated for some of these minority police officers um, and having them think about the impact of the job for them in their community would, would overcome that. And this is a result that was really amazing to me. In a randomized test of those two emails, the new email actually completely eliminated the racial gap on the pass rate for that test. Um, so to me, that and other examples of work we've done really exemplify how powerful this, you know, just knowing about behavioral economics and psychology um, can be for obviously not necessarily solving entire social issues, but making, making you know, pretty serious progress um, towards doing that. So those are a couple of examples. Um, in terms of the team, we really are agnostic as to where we draw our insights from. So it's a lot of behavioral economics, psychology, um, anthropology, really any of the social sciences. But we are really firm on, on testing everything. And so we, we tend to use randomized control trials. Um, and a lot of the work that, that I've been doing in the past um, months in the US office is working with small and mid-sized cities in the US on getting them to um, be more interested in testing these behavioral insights and incorporating them into their work. Um, so that's a little bit about the team, um, and I can talk more about anything that, that you guys are specifically interested in. Um, I've been at the Behavioral Insights team in New York for about six months, and I joined from IBM. I was a strategy consultant there, um, and before that I studied ec healthcare economics at Princeton, so um, it's been nice to kind of explore that in, in the behavioral econ framework at, at this um, company. Um, and in terms of the type of work that, that we do, it's kind of a few core competencies, as you might have kind of guessed from what I've been talking about. So obviously, we spend a lot of our time researching the latest, what's coming out in the behavioral econ literature and psychology. Um, data analytics is part of, kind of part of the role and, and taking, understanding the trends of the cities that we're working with, what are they struggling with, 
and where are kind of pain points that we can address. Um, and then just working with those governments and getting things done. That's honestly a big part of the job. There's, there's a lot of bureaucracy um, and, and just figuring out how do you get to the right person or how do you make the right argument. Um, so those, I guess, would be kind of the three major areas that I would say describe the day-to-day -day work. Um, and in, in terms of advice, I would say, for me, I think actually more and more going forward, the intersection between data and behavioral econ is going to be really important. So um, more and more companies and governments are going to be understanding that it's, it's important to collect that big data and use it to make decisions going forward. So I think actually having a skill set, at least kind of basic data analysis, <laughs> is really important. Um, and, and of course, in conjunction with behavioral econ, liter you know, being up to date on the literature and all that kind of thing. But um, I think probably my biggest advice would be just to make sure you're skilled in that area up to snap so you can best kind of achieve impact in the behavioral economics area. Great. Can I cover the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Welch and I'm with Ideas42 and yes, thank you for having us here. Uh, you actually, you guys are a great audience. I came here like last year around the same time maybe and it was just like such a pleasant presentation and discussion that I had with <laughs> you. I actually took the same presentation and then tried to recycle it a couple weeks later with a, what I thought was a similar audience and it just <laughs> <laughs> um, No, you guys are great. But uh, alright, so four things. Um, all right. I'm going to talk about Ideas 42 first. So, Ideas 42 was originally a Harvard lab, founded here in 2008, assembled a few other folks. Uh, then we spun off into our own entity. Now we are, we're in New York, we're in DC, we're a little bit in Boston. Um, we have one person in Wisconsin? I don't know, somewhere out there. Uh, but. <clears throat> We are now about 70, 75 people, so we've grown a lot, which is pretty nice. Uh, and yeah, okay, so that's what we look like. Uh, so our mission is to take insights from the behavioral sciences and apply those to, uh, I think, like solve some of the world's hardest problems. It's the official spiel uh, in real life. There's a lot more going on, I guess, but it's uh, the general approach. So we. Let's see, I mean, I guess we're more similar to the BIT in that we are taking, we're actually focused on using behavioral science, whatever that may mean, we have the same sort of philosophy that it can be behavioral economics, it can be psychology, anthropology, sociology, whatever. Uh, we, we use all of that. Um, we usually work, we divide our projects into three main types. They are go assist, educate, and invent. So uh, our assist projects are sort of more traditional sort of consulting projects where we're working with a partner to solve a specific problem. We're often doing that. We're a nonprofit, so we're often taking funding from a foundation uh, to work with a local partner. And those can be, and we, we work in a whole bunch of different domains. I think we have seven official domains, which I literally probably couldn't just name off <laughs> the top of my head right now, but everything from healthcare and education and government to Criminal justice and uh, uh, environment, environment's one. <laughs> There's a lot. Uh, so we uh, we work with again with local partners to solve these specific problems, and that's really probably I would say it's like 70% of our work. So a lot of my day to day is uh, is is like partner interaction and managing projects and working with the team to solve some specific problems. So. Um, so that's one set. Uh, then we have these projects called Educate Projects. Uh, and as we've gotten bigger, honestly, they've sort of gotten, the walls between these different areas have sort of fallen a little bit. But uh, in Educate, we put everything where we're trying to like spread the gospel of behavioral science. So we do a lot of workshops. Sometimes we'll do them, we'll call them master classes or whatever we need to call them. Uh, but we'll do them within an industry, say. So we might say, uh, <coughs> Community college administrators, you could all benefit from knowing what behavioral science is and thinking about how to apply it to some problems within your institutions. And so we will host a series or you know, one, two, three, whatever, uh, of master classes where we teach them about behavioral science and how to apply it. Uh, and we've done that in a bunch of different industries. We also recently had our first ever like, public conference. It was called the Behavioral Summit. I don't know. Anybody, anybody go to it? Anybody put the angle in anybody? No? Okay. <laughs> it was uh, 
it was it was our first time doing it, and so we'll publicize it better next time, I promise. <laughs> but but that was interesting for us because again, it's like aligned with this idea of publicizing behavioral science, but starting to think more broadly about how people might use it as it becomes more and more popular and um, so more and more interest in different industries and different people playing different roles in those industries. So uh, so educate, what else falls under there? Uh, white papers, we'll do a bunch of that kind of work. Um, I think that's about it, and we have like a blog and things like that. So general like spreading the, the gospel of behavioral science. And then our final category is invent, and those are dream projects where hopefully a foundation gives us a large sum of money and we just come up, we use it, and we come up with a great solution to a problem, but we don't have to necessarily solve a specific problem with a local partner. Uh, and as we've grown, those have become more common also, but that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the stuff. So we have those assist, kind of consulting projects, educate projects, and then the invent ones, which are a smaller part of our portfolio. Uh, and, and again, most of the day-to-day -day is going to be more of that sort of client work, partner work. Um, you might have some planning if you're doing like a, an event of some sort, master class, there's some special different types of planning that might happen there. That's actually a really interesting, I don't know, we can talk about anything. I'm trying to think of what's different from what you guys have spoken about already. The educate things are actually kind of interesting for me anyway, because I never really thought about how do you, like, how do you teach people to use behavioral science. I, it was just, it's been a whole interesting area to explore that I'm happy to talk about. Um, all right, so that's kind of the overview of our work. Oh, let me give you an example of a project I'm working on right now <laughs> that I'm trying to think through. So uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, gave us a grant to launch work in uh, community health and well-being, sort of broadly defined on purpose. They were interested in seeing some opportunities there behavioral science uh, and the way we went about this I think is fairly typical of other ways that we've kind of entered new industries or new areas where we see a lot of opportunity. Healthcare is a lot of opportunity. It's actually been a little bit slower to adopt it than I would have expected. So like consumer finance, at least in the US, tons of people are interested. Um, financial inclusion, but then once you start moving beyond that, it's a little more, <laughs> it's a little more time. And healthcare to me is like, Everybody, you're, you're aligned. Your incentives are all aligned. <laughs> nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants to die early, presumably. And, and nobody wants to spend a lot of money. And all of this is aligned. And nonetheless, you see behavior that doesn't make sense. So, um, so anyway, so we're moving into this new space now. And the way we did it is we held a request for problems, an RFP. Uh, we solicited applications from communities across the U.S. It was purely a domestic project. Um, and then I think we got like 175 applications, which is a lot for these. Usually we get fewer than that. Um, we went through there and we picked about 20 of those applications to come and attend a workshop, the educate part of our work. Uh, we talked them again about behavioral science and how they might think about applying it. Uh, it was a two-day workshop. We also used it kind of as an audition to see what they were like and kind of get to know the teams better. Uh, and then ultimately, we're, we're in the process right now of sorting through the 19 remaining applicants to select two or three to actually partner with and test something in the field. And so uh, right now, I'm like going through these, these interviews and trying to understand, trying to make a judgment call about where the right place is to start, uh, who the right partner is, which is it's hard. I want to work with everyone. But, uh, so, yeah, so, it's a little bit about Ideas 42. Um, Any advice? Right, advice. Uh, can I do the part where I talk about myself? Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll to that one. Um, so, let's see. I have a background in environmental science. I was an environmental consultant and, like, a landscape architect, sort of. Not really. Landscape designer. Uh, for a little while. And then went to business school and discovered behavioral economics and discovered that it's like the foundation of decision making, which obviously was really important back then when I was interested in environmental science, and then suddenly became sort of my whole focus in the end, and that's why I found Ideas 42. Um, that's, that was what I mean. So wait, okay, advice. <laughs> oh, no. All right, so let's see. Um, what you guys said made a lot of sense. I think we could add something else. Um, I don't know, I guess I could just kind of reiterate, I think, the, the point that there's a lot out there that's behavioral science focused, that has an aspect of behavioral science to it, but it's not explicitly described as such. So like, when I was interested in behavior, I mean, 
I guess if you were doing behavioral science just a few years ago even, you had to basically come work for a place that was explicitly using it, right? But now, there's actually a lot to be gained that you can go into an institution, an organization that's not explicitly using it, but has a big opportunity to do so. So you could be their internal behavioral science champion, and that would be a pretty cool job.